is still very, very present that we're seeing in different lights. Dr. Jim Campbell, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit about your time being born in 1925, uh, becoming a scholar, very educated in your right, and matriculating through the times. Some of the pros and cons that you've seen as far as Caucasian America versus minority America, how their way of thinking is different, what are the pros and cons that we still face today on a global level and on a local level here in Charleston as it relates to access, as Dr. John Abella mentioned. Let us rem remember that uh, each of your comments should be no more than three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> 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 No, Marvin, I wouldn't get on. <laughs> you make me feel as though I'm home. <laughs> I have a niece who abuses me by introducing me as her uncle. No, no, well, yes, I do. Well, thank you very much for having me and for putting this together. Importantly, in the tradition of W.B. Du Bois and the idea of the talented tenth that he put out in 1903. I worked with the last project of Dr. Du Bois just after he joined the Communist Party and left for Ghana. That project was called Freedom Ways Magazine. The Journal of the Freedom Movement. In my collection at Avery, every issue is there, the entire collection of Freedom Waves. I advise you to go into that collection and read some of the articles from Freedom Waves. It touches on the substantive content of the question you posed to me in terms of the difference between Caucasians and African Americans. That's a very long subject, but we share a commonality of class that we've never really examined. And that class commonality is most pronounced in the South among what is called poor whites and African Americans. And I'm noticing that increasingly the cutting edges of our movement, the freedom movement, is including some poor whites in the gathering. Look at that demonstration that's going on in North Carolina with Reverend Bob. Mm -hmm. Those audiences of black folk and poor whites out of the worst economic conditions that are not only in North Carolina, but in South Carolina, throughout what you talk about as the Southeast region. Geographically, the Southeast region is the old Confederacy. Check out the states that you call your organizing for your Chamber of Commerce. You're organizing geographically in the old Confederacy. That's the Southeast region of this country. And the ideology out of that region is what is infect, infecting the national agenda of the country and what, is, what we consider the preconditions of fascism. That's the ideology of the Confederacy. The totalitarian state idea is the state of the old Confederacy. You want to get an example of a totalitarian state. Don't look to Russia or China or Korea. Look at the Confederacy of the United States of America. I have for you a handout. It's a handout I use with graduate students at Bank Street Teachers College. Bank Street is a progressive college in New York where I did my 
graduate work was also on faculty for a while. But I used this handout in the 1970s. And what it does is it looks at how the society is organized. It is still valid and reliable. On it are some things I've written in. I picked it up in the 90s for a talk at Avery, and more recently with Reverend Ed McLean, the, uh, the, uh, his ministerial alliance group last year. But I've written in where today's issues are located. As the Chamber of Commerce, and some of the questions that you raised earlier, that you addressed to the diversity office at the college and to Duane, whom I met years ago when I first got back home, um, and to the senatorial candidate. Am I just meeting you? Thanks for running in this area. Um, I've penciled in the issues that we face today and it addresses the content of education. Central to what you're advocating is how money is produced. More congenital to that issue is the idea of you, you have two key components. You have an object of labor and you have labor. The objects of labor are what you transform into products. Today, a key object of labor for technology, we're meeting in a building. You know what the title of this building is? This is a biotechnology center. I came to the dedication of this building well, last year I think it was, and stayed for the grand rounds, which is the talk a physician gives to anybody in an auditorium. One minute, Dr. And went upstairs to see what was in the building. Biotechnology today works on human biological material. Blood, cells, tissues, and organs. In Charleston, on Meeting Street, three years ago, 2010, was, 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 organized, was um, initiated a biotechnology center using tonsils that have been stored in a tissue bank. Now that center on Meeting Street will use those tonsils to produce products. That's where we are today. That's the challenge of education. That's what's being invested in. Therein is the difference between how we approach things and people in other communities approach things. Now I'm going to share with you the handout. Look at it, study it, the schema relationship between the base of society and the superstructure of society will take some explanation. I did it over the course of a year with students working on their masters in education. So if you want to get in touch with me, I'll leave my card with this young man, Henry Ravenel, and his staff, and I'd be happy to come to your organization and explain that schema to you. So if you will help me now, I want to pass this out. My James. Yes. There are a couple of cartoons. You always need to lighten what you're doing. But the substantive stuff in this is the, that is the schema. Thank you very much. I'll pass this out to the panelists. Let's give it a Metamore, being with your organization, 